He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, Welcome everyone back again this morning. Uh, those here in the sanctuary, we have some of our seasonal folks that are beginning to make their way back down to Florida. We've ordered the very best of weather for them. Uh, it's cool, the humidity is low, and, uh, but they tell me that driving down was a little interesting with all of the trucks on the highway. So we welcome everyone that is back with us. We welcome our new online viewers, folks that have joined us and are joining us this morning for the very first time. So God bless you for being part of our online congregation. You see OGFMC there on the front of the pulpit. And uh, we invite you to go there, check out our website. And if it's something that, that you would like to follow us or be a part of that, send us an email and we will make sure that we put you on our mailing list. We are in the 
fourth week of our sermon series of five weeks, just to give you hope that I'm not going to run this down for 25 or 26 weeks. Uh, but this is week four of five weeks in our sermon series, Words Matter. And we've been learning some really interesting things. Those of you that uh, are joining us for the very first time, do not fear. Uh, all of the previous sermons are li listed there on the website, so uh, you can always uh, go back and get caught up. But we live in a world, I'm gonna, this is probably going to shock you, all right? So brace yourself, get a hold of something. We live in a world filled with conflict. Conflict. Whether it is between nations, communities, families, individuals, it doesn't matter. There, there is conflict. And as long as we are on this side of heaven, and as long as we are intermingled in this world population, and as long as we have families and friends and neighbors and co-workers, there is always going to be conflict. That's not to say that conflict is sinful, but how you deal with it can be. So we're taking a look at, at how words can actually be fighting words in the way that we say things and the way that we take things. But have you ever stopped to wonder why we fight? Now, if you have two small children in your house, you don't need a reason. That's just sibling rivalry. And that just happens. And if you only have one child in your house, I heard a fellow say one time that that doesn't even qualify you to be a parent because if something gets broken, you already know who did it. You don't have to hear, will you stop touching me? Or I didn't do it, they did it. They said it first. That's not my fault. You, you don't have all of that. So children, sibling rivalry, and it doesn't even stop when you become adults because you have all that baggage that you can take right into adulthood with you. But what is really behind the quarrels that so often erupt in relationships? James gives us an answer that points inward, not outward. It's so easy to place the blame on a conflict on someone else, isn't it? We say, well, it's not my fault, it's their fault. But James doesn't say it's because of politics. He doesn't say it's because of other people's actions. But he does tell us that it's something happening within each one of us, our own desires. So this week in the sermon, Fighting Words, it explores how these desires give rise to conflict and how we can change the way that we handle them. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would please help us to identify and work through the sinful brokenness inside each and every one of us. We ask you to heal us, Lord, from our misaligned motives that can cause quarrels and fights among us. Redeem our internal lives, Lord, so that our external ones may bring you glory in and through all things we ask in your name. Amen. In this book of James, we encounter a letter filled with practical wisdom that challenges us to respond to God's word in ways that transform our lives. I don't know if you think about the word of God as something that can transform you, or do you just look at it as a book that gives you some guidance? Do you see it as something that can really utterly change your life, or do you see it as just good advice for a living. James, the brother of Jesus, by the way, doesn't shy away from urging believers to go beyond intellectual belief and embrace a faith that is lived out in everyday actions every single day. 
He makes it clear that faith must not remain confined to thoughts and words. Instead, it should manifest in tangible responses that reflect God's words and to reflect God's spirit within each and every one of us. So if we look at this passage and we look at this letter of James as a mirror, it prompts us to examine how we respond to the word and whether our faith is active and authentic or not. That last truth I mentioned is especially evident when we consider how our internal sinful desires are at the root of the external fights and quarrels that break out among us. So I want us to take a look at this really short passage. It's just three verses. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it says this, What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have. So you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Now, I don't know about you, but when you read that, you say, whew, boy, have I seen that in my life, or have I seen that in the lives of others? Have I seen that between nations and peoples and religious groups? I mean, it... That conflict is evident everywhere, and you don't have to go back a long ways in history, although if you do, you'll see the same pattern that goes on for centuries. Nation rising against nation to take what that nation has because they don't have it, but they want it. Now, I wish I could remember the name of the song. Um you'll probably be able to help me out with this, but there, there was a song in the early 70s that, that uh, was a song about people warring against each other, and when they finally were able to, to conquer the people, they went up and they turned over the rock where the secret was buried, and all it said was peace on earth. That's all it said. Yes, one tin soldier rides away. That's it. Can you remember the who did it? <laughs> yeah, it was on the movie Billy Jack, right? So it goes back a ways. So see, I've got, I've got this intellectual group here that can help me answer these questions. But what is the root of conflict then? How do we look at all of those things and what is the cause? What makes that come about? It is, according to James 4.1, selfish desires. They don't come from just anywhere, but they come from the evil desires at war within you. That is what causes quarrels and fights, he says. James cuts to the very heart of the matter, telling us that conflict originates not from external factors, but from within ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but when I file that away in my head and I'm thinking or looking at a conflict, it is so easy to place that blame on the other person or even to put that on the, the blame or lay the blame on a situation. And yet, what is it that makes us angry? It's us. I had a fellow tell me one time, he says, you know, you choose to be angry. And there are times that I get angry. That is not the time to remind me that, you know, you're angry because you choose to be angry. Don't tell me that then. Let me cool down a little bit. But James tells us at the very center of every fight is a clash of desires. 
we all want things, whether it's control, recognition, comfort, power. These desires aren't necessarily evil in themselves, but when they go unmet, they stir up bitterness, frustration, and eventually quarrels that break out because I want what I want, and I want it now, right? What's one of the first words that children learn besides no, and usually dad, much to mom's chagrin, but it's usually mine, right? Mine. It is a, a word that is very common in all of nature. If you don't believe that, go listen to the seagulls. That's all they say. Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> you throw chips out on the ground, what do they say? Mine. I actually saw a seagull one time. Emily and I were sitting on the beach, and I threw a Dorito. For, and actually, I had a seagull steal a half of a bologna sandwich right out of my hand. Little boogers. But I threw this Dorito chip out on the sand, and the seagull came over. And he was keeping all of the other seagulls run off, so we thought like we owed him something, you know, helping to pay his rent or whatever. So I flipped a chip to him, and he picked that chip up, and he ran down into the surf, dropped the chip in the surf, flipped it over a couple of times, and picked it up and ate it. Too much salt. <laughs> no, yeah, too much salt on the chip. But Emily watched this bird do that, and she goes, you know, that kind of bothers me a little bit. He he thought that through. You know, he's got a plan, right? He had a plan. He, for whatever reason, he dipped it in the water to, you know, to make it softer. We don't know. But seagulls, they scream out mine all the time. Think of the last argument that you were in. What was driving you? Was it really about the issue at hand, or was there something else deeper that was going on, and it just kind of rose to the surface? Perhaps you felt disrespected or overlooked. Maybe you wanted to assert your control over a situation, and when that control was threatened, you lashed out. There is nothing that will create harder feelings quicker than being disrespected or ignored, especially if you're trying to help and someone says, well, I don't need your help. Oh, well, fine, right? That's the, that's the first thing that comes to our mind. Fine, go ahead and do it yourself then. And we walk away. And we still see them struggling. And we may relent and go back and help. But be honest, don't we look at that situation and say, I'm glad they're having a hard time with it, right? I mean, be honest, that's what we're thinking. <laughs> but James invites us to look honestly at ourselves, asking us to admit that many of our conflicts are born out of selfish ambition. The internal battle spills over into our relationships, leading to quarrels and fights. It can be difficult to be honest about this, to admit our own brokenness, but we all have it. We don't want to say it's our fault. It's, it's way too easy to blame it on someone else to justify our own actions. So we need to take a step back and examine our own hearts. When you feel tension rising in a conversation or a conflict brewing, ask yourself, what do I really want here? What's the goal? What am I trying to accomplish? Is it more important for me to be right, to win, or to be understood? Or is it more important to seek peace and preserve the relationship? Identifying your underlying desires can help diffuse a situation before it escalates. We find that in Genesis 4, we had two brothers, Cain and Abel. 
Abel gave a sacrifice to the Lord that was accepting and pleasing to God. But Cain, for some reason, his attitude and his offering was askew. And he was jealous of his brother. And you know why he killed his brother? Because he didn't have the relationship that his brother had with God. Probably the first religious conflict on record. He was angry with his brother. And his brother said, why, why are you angry at me? If you would have done the right thing, wouldn't God have accepted your sacrifice, your offering as well? So why are you angry at me? And rather than trying to talk it out, Cain killed his brother. Now there's a whole lot of things, and I could, I could branch off into that passage and tell you that, that there's so many different aspects of that story of why he felt like he needed to take his brother's life. Well, if I take my brother's life, maybe I will be able to have what he has. Well, his relationship with God wasn't something that was transferable. It was the problem in Cain's own heart. Him taking Abel's offering and using that as his own wasn't going to work because it wasn't his offering. Again, it wasn't his brother's fault. So the selfish desires. That story shows how destructive our unchecked desires can be when we fail to bring them before God. So selfish desires. Secondly, unmet desires lead to destructive actions. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Nobody ever takes a thief to court and the judge looks at the thief and says, well, why did you steal it? It seems to be kind of a stupid question. <laughs> why did you steal that car? Well, I didn't like where it was parked. No. I wanted it. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to sell it or I'm going to whatever. It was for selfish means. The judge never asked somebody why you did what you did. They just see whether or not they're guilty. James goes on to describe what happens when our desires are frustrated. They lead to harmful actions. We may not literally kill someone, but we often kill relationships with our words. We kill trust with our actions, or we kill peace with our bitterness. You see, when we covet, that's desiring something that's not ours, we're not entitled to. When we long for something that doesn't belong to us, we are willing to harm others together, whether through manipulation, gossip, or outright aggression. Have you ever had somebody lie about you and it's not true? How did that make you feel? And what was the motivation for that lie? This echoes what Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, where he equates hatred in the heart with murder. It's a sobering thought that the conflicts we harbor, even those we think of as small, can have spiritually destructive consequences. It doesn't take a big situation to burn our life down. Reflect on the way that unmet desires might be affecting your relationships this morning. There are situations where your frustration over not getting what you want has led you to act out in anger, whether through harsh words, passive aggressive behavior, resentment. All of these actions tear down and tear at the people around you. When faced with unmet desires, we must choose between feeding the frustration or surrendering the desire to God. It's a choice. In the same way that we choose to be angry, we choose to surrender that attitude or that choice to God, or we choose to take it out on someone else. Now, I've got to be honest with you. You go to a customer service counter, 
<laughs> and you're trying to get help and you're not getting what you're expecting, it's easy to make that person the target. And it's extremely difficult to look at that situation and say, what is God trying to teach me here? That's just not generally the way we think. But we want to lash out because that's what we want. That's what we deserve. Now, that's not to say that people in service industries and such that they haven't unperformed or didn't perform properly or adequately and you're trying to get some type of satisfaction for what you paid for. That's a different situation. But you can still be forceful and yet kind and godly. Saul's unmet desire drove him to irrational, violent actions, chasing David to kill him out of fear and jealousy because he knew that David was going to be the next king. Well, if I kill David, then I get to stay king, right? But that wasn't God's will and way. This is obviously the outcome that we want to avoid as we take our broken desires and sinful frustrations to God. It requires us to take a good, hard look at ourselves. But then thirdly, the misuse of prayer. I find that term in itself to be bizarre. Misuse of prayer. How in the world can you misuse prayer? James says you don't have what you want because you don't ask for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You only <laughs> want what will give you pleasure and you want it now, right? Finally, James shifts our attention to how we approach God with our desires. It's not just about the fact that we have desires, but how we handle them. We all have desires. That's the way we're made. Do we take them to God in prayer or do we try to satisfy them on our own? And when we do pray, are our prayers driven by a desire for God's will to be done or are we simply asking him to fulfill our own selfish wants? Big difference. James calls us out in this passage for asking with the wrong motives. Treating God, believe it or not, like a vending machine to fulfill our pleasures, rather than a loving God who wants to shape us according to his will. We want what God can give, and God, gimme, 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 gimme. True prayer is about aligning ourselves with God's heart, not just seeking what we want. We have to consider how we approach God in prayer. Are you asking for things that will ultimately glorify him and bring you closer to his purposes? Or are you asking out of selfish ambition? When you feel frustrated because your prayers seem unanswered, ask yourself, am I praying with the right motives? You see, true prayer seeks transformation of the heart, not just the fulfillment of desires. True prayer happens in a relationship. And within that relationship, we learn to trust the outcome no matter what happens. Prayer to God is in the context of relationship. Think about how Jesus teaches us to pray. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a common statement. We've repeated it a thousand times in our, in our lifetime. But this is a model of how our prayer should be aligned with God's will. Instead of focusing on personal gain, we're called on to surrender our desires to God and trust that his will is best for us. And I'll be honest with you, it takes real practice to pray that way. It doesn't come easy. And it takes an ample dose of humility. But trust me, it's worth the effort. So how do, we, how do we bring all of this together? James, in this passage, exam, calls upon us to examine our hearts and our approach to conflict. It's complicated because we are complicated. It's difficult because our deep-seated sin and brokenness are difficult to uproot our own will and our own way. We try to reason with ourselves 
or strike a bargain with God when in reality we should surrender to God's will and seek what he is asking of us. Here's several ways that we can put this message into practice this coming week. Here's your homework. Examine your desires. Whenever you face a conflict, take time to reflect on the underlying desires driving your frustration and ask yourself, is it a desire for control, comfort, or approval? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I feel this way? Bring these desires before God and ask him to purify your motives. It doesn't mean that that isn't there, but you're asking God, help me to understand it and help me to deal with it. Secondly, surrender to God's will. Rather than fighting to get your own way, learn to surrender your desires to God. It does not mean that your desires don't matter, but it does mean that trusting that God's will is more important than your own is paramount. Thirdly, pray for transformation. Let your prayers become more about transformation than getting what you want. Ask God to align your heart with his, to give you a desire for peace, humility, and love, even in the midst of the conflict. And then fourthly, seek peace, not victory. In moments of conflict, choose to be a peacemaker rather than someone who needs to win. Have you ever played a board game with somebody that just has to win? At all cost, have to win. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So by applying these principles, and others that we learn throughout the book of James, we can move away from quarrels and fights toward a life marked by peace, humility, and a deeper trust in God's provision and purposes. And hopefully along the way, we even get to experience a little bit of that peace that transcends all understanding. That's what the Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians. So what are we going to do? Are we willing to surrender and to live at peace, recognize what is right and what is wrong? That's not to say you will never disagree. You know, there's an old statement, is this a hill worth dying on? When you really look at things, you look at that and you say, no, it really isn't. It's not that important. And attitudes and emotions can rule the day. And if you can just back up and take a solid look at things, you'll be amazed at how God can work through each and every situation. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this word. There is not one of us here this morning, not one of us that is watching this video that can say they've never had a quarrel, They've never had a disagreement. They've never gotten angry. They've never felt resentment. We've all been there. And many times, Lord, the way that we feel is with selfish motives. Lord, help us to put self out of work. Help us to put you in control of our life in every situation, even the difficult ones where we can feel neglected or misunderstood or angry, ignored. Help us, O oh God, to rest upon your peace and to allow your spirit to guide us in everything that we say, in everything that we do, in the way that we act and react. Help us to be people of peace, people of love, people guided by your Holy Spirit in all ways and in all things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Oh